Well, good morning. Do you remember way back when you used to choose your your breakfast cereal choice by which cartoon-laden box promised you the best prize down at the bottom? Remember that? I remember... Uh, being at my grandparents' house. Quite specifically, I remember standing in my grandmother's kitchen, having chosen that week's sugar-frosted whatever it was, in order to get a secret message decoder ring. Yeah, that was the thing. I had grandiose plans for sending and receiving all sorts of secret messages with the neighbor kid, messages that my grandparents and, most importantly, my sister would not be able to decode. I remember how shatteringly disappointed I was when I discovered that really the only message that decoder ring could decode was something about how that brand of cereal was the best. It wasn't. If, like me, you live with a tinge of angst over uh, this sort of childhood disappointment, you're going to love this morning's message because this morning Jesus is sending you a secret message. Seriously. What he says here in Luke 14, it may seem to the casual observer to be nothing more than some rather trite advice for social climbers. But if you have the secret message decoder, the Holy Spirit, you're going to find out that he's saying a whole lot more. You think I'm nuts? You probably do, but it's it's justified. Um, Think about this for a moment. In in Mark chapter 4, there in verses 11 and 12, Jesus... It tells us that when he is speaking in parables, that no, he is not uh, giving analogies to help more and more people understand his teaching, but he is actually doing exactly the opposite. He's camouflaging his truth. He's camouflaging what he says in order to prevent those who are insincere or merely curious from becoming inoculated or hardened against the spiritual truths that he's unveiling. Listen to what Jesus says in Mark chapter 4. There it says that he answered them, speaking of his disciples who had asked him, hey, what's up with the stories? Why all the parables? He says, To you, the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given, but to those outside, everything comes in parables. Why? So that they may indeed look and yet not perceive. They may indeed listen and yet not understand. Otherwise, they might turn back and be forgiven. Now, does that coming from the mouth of Jesus confuse or surprise you? Maybe maybe it does. Uh, but understand this. Here's, here's what the Lord is about here. He wants something very specific in regards to a response to his teaching. He is not interested in the least with finding out who will like what it is that he says. He, he is not at all interested in, in discovering who agrees with him. No, what Jesus wants more than anything else is for men and women to base their lives on what it is that he is saying. He wants those who who will take what he says, they'll hear it, they'll receive it, and then they will put it into practice in their lives. They will live it out and they will live for it. What Jesus is after is disciples, not admirers. What Jesus is trying to prevent by teaching in parables is having those who 
are, are merely casual listeners, having them hear his, his truths, his teaching, and, and because they hear it, but they have no intention whatsoever to put it into practice, they become inoculated or hardened against what it is that he is saying. You see, parables allow those who are spiritually receptive those who are seeking truth. It allows them to hear the story behind the story. It allows them to understand the spiritual truth that Jesus is pointing to, all while the spiritually closed person, the person who really does not want the truth, hears just yet another story. Through parables, Jesus communicates spiritual truth to those who, who have God's Holy Spirit and are able to receive it. This is what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It says the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit because it's foolishness to them. He's not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. The spiritual person, however, Paul says, can evaluate everything. My hope for you is that this morning you will hear what he says as, as those who belong to God and who have been given his Holy Spirit and that you will ask God's Holy Spirit to open his word to you that you might not only understand the story behind the story, but you might embrace it, receive it, and ask him to to apply it not only to your understanding, but to the living of your lives. Let's look at it together. Grab your Bibles, open up to Luke 14. Luke 14, we're going to look at just verses 7 through 14. And understand, as we look at this passage, what we're reading here, it isn't just Jesus' guide for social climbers, okay? Rather, Jesus is having dinner with these Pharisees, and through parables about humility and social equity, he is seeking to challenge those who are receptive to hear what he has to say in regards to having humility as they stand before God and embracing God's eternal perspective in regard to their lives. Let's take a look at it. You got your Bible? Grab it. Chapter 14, verse 7. Why don't you stand? I'll read our passage. You can follow along. Luke writes in regard to Jesus, he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they would choose the best place for themselves. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, don't sit at the place of honor because a more distinguished person than you may have been invited by your host. The one who invited both of you may come and say to you, give your place to this man. And then in humiliation, you will proceed to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when the one who invited you comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher. You will then be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, when you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors, because they might invite you back and you would be repaid. On the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, maimed, lame, or blind, and you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Father, we, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. God, not just that we would understand uh, the words that are written, but that we would understand the concepts that you are seeking to communicate to those who are receptive. God, we want to be those. We want to be receptive. We know that requires the work of your Holy Spirit to to make us willing, open, attentive, for us to comprehend. 
important for us to grab hold of these things. We ask you to do that in us, Lord. We need you to do that in us. Speak to us in this time. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You can sit down. It would be easy just to casually read through uh, this account of Jesus' dinner with the Pharisees and, and to, to understand what he says here is nothing more than advice on how to do well socially. Except for the fact that Luke tells us right there in verse 7. Right there in verse 7, he says that what Jesus says here, that these are parables. And once we know that uh, the, what we're reading here, that it's a parable, then we know that there is a second layer of meaning, a spiritual truth that Jesus is seeking to communicate to those who are willing to receive it. Let me be very clear. What we're doing here is not spiritualizing the text, taking a, a, just a very clearly literal text and then assigning some manufactured meaning to it. But rather, we are treating this text very literally in that Jesus had said that this is a parable. And so since it's a parable, we understand that there is a story that has a meaning that is greater than just the story. So the parable is told as Jesus watches the dinner guests come in for that evening's dinner and begin to choose the best places for themselves. And so what Jesus describes here, what it is that he's addressing is going on right in front of them as he speaks. They're at a dinner party, and so as always, those who, who, who come in they are, they are looking for their place to sit, and they know that those who are most important, those who have the highest social rank there within that community, that they will be seated closest to the host. And everyone wants to be most important. And so as they come in, they're jockeying for position. They're feeling the room. They're trying to get a sense for where they fit, and they're trying to advance themselves just a, a little bit further. They're all wanting to claim that highest possible seat for themselves and thus establish and thus display to all their standing above those who are below them. Well, seeing this, Jesus offers them some friendly advice. Verse 8, uh, when you are invited by someone to a banquet, don't just sit in the place of honor because what's going to happen? If someone more important than you, more distinguished than you, ha has also been invited, and then your host will come, and, and he'll turn to you and say, what are you doing up here? This man is more important than you. Move down. And then in humiliation, you will move down. And the only place that will be available will be that lowest place because no one wanted it. Jesus says, don't seat yourself above your position. It's interesting, in that culture, I don't think we would be so prone to do it today, but in that culture, the host would not have hesitated to move someone if someone in their view of a higher standing was present. And that would be rather embarrassing, wouldn't it? And so Jesus says in verse 10, instead, take this approach. Uh, go and sit in the lowest place so that uh, when the one who invites you comes, he'll say to you, what are you doing down here? What are you doing way down here? You're much more important than this. Come on up higher. And then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. And so Jesus says, embrace humility. Take the low position and let the host move you up. That way, instead of public humiliation, you will find yourself publicly honored. Sounds kind of weird to have Jesus give that kind of advice, doesn't it? We've got to remember that that's the parable. 
that's the story and that there is a meaning beyond the story. It, Jesus isn't just giving advice on how to avoid social embarrassment. It, this isn't just an, an interactional maneuver, because it does. It feels kind of manipulative, doesn't it? Oh, take that low spot, obviously low, so that you will then be moved up. No, Jesus is hes pointing towards something bigger than this story. A concept that he summarizes there in verse 11. Look at verse 11. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, if you stop and think for a minute and give this an honest evaluation, think about your life experience, what you've seen that others have experienced, I think we have to admit that this is not a terribly accurate description of how things work in this life. There are plenty of people, are there not, who exalt themselves but don't get humbled. And there are many in this life who are truly humble and they live their lives unnoticed. kind of bothers us, doesn't it, that the arrogant jerk doesn't always get his comeuppance in this life? But if you take eternity into account, if you take eternity into account, if you evaluate each life not not just in terms of the years that are lived here on this planet, but if you take all of eternity into account, into account, you will see that justice is always served. What Jesus says is true. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. You see, God promises us that the day will come. The day will come when he will set all things right. And because of that, Here's our greater truth within the story. We will do far better to humble ourselves before God and to let him redeem us, to let him move us up to a high position rather than to arrogantly assume a high position for ourselves only to have him humble us come judgment. Now think for a minute about the crowd to whom Jesus is speaking here. He is at dinner with a group of Pharisees. Pharisees and men who were banking on their strict performance of the law to give them a high position with God. Jesus tells them they will do better to humble themselves before God to receive his mercy because otherwise what they're going to receive is his justice. Their proud self-declared superiority, it may impress people that they live around and with, but it won't mean a thing on that day. It won't impress God at all. In fact, it will only serve to separate them from God's gracious mercy. Because you see, on that day, God will deliver absolute justice. You ever been wronged? And you cry out, I want justice. No, you don't. <laughs> not real justice. Not absolute justice. Not the kind of justice that, that, that it's talking about here. Oh, you might want relative justice. You know, next to, and next to this arrogant jerk, maybe you want justice if, with what he did to you, but you don't want actual justice. No, what you want is actual mercy. You see, on that day, that day when God sets all things right, he will deliver a justice more exacting and more demanding than anyone can endure. 
That's a warning that is sounded all through Scripture. Old Testament, New Testament. It, it talks about God's coming judgment and our need to humbly embrace his mercy. Uh, that, that justice will mean our destruction, but mercy is our salvation. Uh, think back even into Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, for the devious are detestable to the Lord, but he is a friend of the upright. The Lord's curse is on the household of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. He mocks those who mock, but he gives grace to the humble. How about James 4.10? Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Not necessarily in this life, but in the grand sum, yes. 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you. When? At the proper time. Oh, humility is a good thing, isn't it? Humility is something we should all embrace. But humility before God, that's vital. That's vital. Both pride and false humility, we, we find them revolting. But let me tell you this, pridefully thinking that we can measure up to God's standards, that's not just revolting, that's fatal. Only those who humble themselves and seek God's forgiveness and mercy will be saved. Humility and mercy or unrelenting justice. You choose. Verse 12, Jesus said to the one who invited him, when you give a lunch or dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers, sisters, relatives, or rich neighbors. They might invite you back, and you would be repaid. So social standing in that day, much like it is today, was determined and displayed by invitations to events like the one that they're enjoying that evening. Being invited meant that you were important. You were an insider. And so the socially acceptable thing was to invite those who had invited you, to, to boost their standing just as they had boosted yours. I'm sure that as they looked around that room, they saw faces they recognized, people they knew that they were familiar with, fellow insiders whom they helped to get in and who helped them to become an insider as well. And they had been invited not only to boost the status of their host, but in order uh, to respond and then to return the favor. Jesus suggests to them a different approach. Verse 13, on the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. Now think about this. These are Pharisees. The Pharisees would not even touch these people, let alone invite them into their home. They were people that would have been viewed as being, as being judged by God, and that's why they were experiencing what they were. And Jesus says, invite them and you'll be blessed because they can't repay you. What Jesus is telling them is, reject this whole social status system. Invite and include those who have no status, no power, and can provide you with no boost. Break free from this world's quid pro quo. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours system. Where everything really comes down to self-interest. I'll help you, but only because you can then Help me in exchange. And where other people end up becoming nothing more than pawns who either boost you or drag you down. Now again, what Jesus says here, it isn't just advice for improving our, our social dynamics. It's a parable. And so there's a greater truth here that Jesus is pointing to. And again, it's right there. I think if you look at the end of verse 14, uh, he, he says that those who invite the powerless, though the powerless can't repay them, what does he say? 
you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. You see, Jesus is pointing them away from being focused on this life. Uh, he's pointing them away from prioritizing their status in the here and the now and, and toward understanding life rather through the lens of eternity. He wants them and he wants us to consider and now to consider today how it is that we will view those things that we do in the here and now once we have crossed over into eternity. He wants us to live our lives, not according to how things are now, but according to how they will be when we are with him then in heaven. He wants us to disregard the immediate, the temporal, and to instead prioritize the eternal. I love eating ice cream. You know, I've noticed as I, I've gotten older, ice cream does not love me back. It, it's not kind to me at all. And yet we get together at these family gatherings and, and, and they buy ice cream for like 200 people. And, and there it is, beautiful and shimmering, cold and just, just popping with various flavors. It looks delightful. I, now, I know, I know what it, what's going to happen if I eat it. And so I decline. But then before they put it away, I go and get a bigger bowl bigger than the little bowls they were serving it into, and I heap it up and I eat it. And what God would tell me is, think about the future, son, not the moment. Oh, it tastes so good going down, but it is so wicked when it gets there. The Lord, he would tell these Pharisees, I want you to think about not just the now, not just this moment, but I want you to think about how you're going to view your life when you're no longer in this life, but you are now standing in eternity. Now, for those Pharisees, it's going to mean that they are going to abandon their obsession with appearances. I and mean, we can get that way, can't we? We can be so obsessed with everyone being so impressed with how together we are, how we've got it all together. Everything's good here. There's nothing to look at here. Like the Pharisees, we can tend to put our good deeds on display to the point that we can make them a public spectacle. And instead, Jesus says, no, what I want you to do when you do good is to do it so secretly that your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is doing. Well, what Jesus is saying to these Pharisees is, I, I want you to do what you do because it's the right thing to do, not because it's going to make you look good. I want you to do what you do because you love the Lord so passionately, not because it's going to impress anyone who might see you. So here's Jesus having dinner with some Pharisees, telling some parables, asking them to look at their life, at their present situation, not from the perspective of the moment that they're in, but to step back, to consider their life, to consider how they're living, to contemplate their, their present situation from the perspective of eternity. And that, that's a good call for all of us, isn't it? So often, so many of the things going on in life, they get right here, they get... 
right in our face and 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 they overwhelm us and and they keep us from seeing anything else and what the lord says is i want you to step back i want you to step back not just gain a little earthly perspective but i want you to step all the way back and imagine how you will see this moment how you will see this circumstance in which you find yourself when you're looking at it from the other side of glory. How would you walk in today different if you were seeing it, and not from this earth, but seeing your situation from the perspective of eternity? That's how he wants us to live. So here's Jesus at dinner with some Pharisees. He talks to them about humility. He talks to them about rejecting the social status machine. But really, he's talking to them about something more. He's talking to them about submitting themselves, humbling themselves, and receiving his mercy that will redeem them and embracing his ways, his perspectives that will transform them. You're in a dangerous place today because we've just taken these truths that Jesus has presented and we've taken them out of the parable. And we've laid them out plainly. And so two paths lie in front of us. Oh, one path will be understanding, but choosing not to embrace these truths. Uh, continuing in our pride that, that I've got it together and, and, and that uh, I'm performing well. Continuing to operate our lives based upon the realities of this life. And when we reject the truth that he's given us, we become more and more hardened against him. The other path is better. The other path is more chaotic, but it's far, far better. And that's submitting ourselves in humility. It's confessing the reality that we're a mess and we need his mercy and we need his grace and we need his forgiveness and we need it every moment. And choosing to see our lives not through the lens of how things play out in the here and now, but through the lens of how we will view them on that day when we're with him there in glory. That's a chaotic path, but it's a good path. Let's pray. Father, we need you. We need you to help us, Lord. Your word promises us that you not only give us the ability to understand that, that your Holy Spirit is our teacher, but you give us the will and the ability to do the things that you call us to. And Lord, as you call us to to embrace these truths, God, give us even the want to. Give us the courage to. The courage to shed the appearances, to shed the, the manipulation of trying to keep it all together. Instead, Lord, to just embrace your grace your mercy, to admit our need, and to see our life not so much from our perspective, but rather from yours. Give us your eyes, Lord, and give us a boldness to walk in the ways that you would lead. We pray it all in Jesus' name.